What's that? My name, her full name is Gogi Wadiong. It simply means Gogi, son of Diong. So my name is Gogi. But if you ask which Gogi, because there are many Gogis, then it's Gogi Wadiong, son of Diong. So Diong is my father's name. When I began to write in 1960, was 60s, you know, uh, there were really few African writers, you know, uh, but now there are very many, the younger generation, very many writers, you know, uh, including from my own family, you know. There's one uh, problem right now in African literature, and that this literature is written largely in European languages, you know. So even those writers of our generation, you know, we wrote in English, French, or Portuguese, okay? And that trend continues to the present. So the struggle that there is now also is a struggle for where African writing in African languages is trying to assert itself, you know, yeah. Is that for me, is literature written by African people in African languages. You know, just like Spanish literature is written in Spanish, but you cannot tell me there's Spanish literature written in Zulu. Uh, you can't say that, oh, Spanish literature is only that literature which is written in French, <laughs> right? Or French literature is French literature written in Chinese, <laughs> right? Well, I think it's a, I like to call it now Europhone African literature, uh, Europhone, because just like you talk about Francophone, uh, Anglophone, and so on. What I wrote in English, in, say, A Grain of Wheat, Petals of Blood, with no child, there were between all those are part of Europhone African literature, you know. But, uh, and which is different from literature written by Africans in African languages, yeah. Language is part of the identity of any given literature, okay, yeah. The literature of African diaspora, you know, has been very, very important for the development of African literature, you know, on the continent, you know, uh, of the development of, of African writers on the continent. For instance, uh, when I went to, to study postgraduate work in England, I chose to, to do work not on European writers, but on Caribbean writers, you know, on the work of George Lauming and other Caribbean writers who were writing at the time, you know. It was a very, very important thing uh, for me to have been able to connect African literature, Caribbean literature, and in the process also discovered African-American literature, you know. Uh, and collectively, that literature became very, very important when in 1969, 68, I returned to Kenya to teach and began to challenge the dominance of English literature department as then organized, you know. Uh, because in those days, the study of our literature meant the study of English literature or the study of European literature. And in Nairobi University, from nice, we changed all that. We said in Africa, African literature or literature written by African people must be at the center. Yes, you start with the African literature at the center and then radi they radiate outward to other literatures. Yeah. Not as it was before, where English, English literature, yeah, yeah. Uh, French literature is the center. We said, no, African literature is the center of our universe 
but then we can add other literatures to it, yeah. In 1967 for a year, I was put in a maximum security prison in Kenya for writing my first play in Ikoyo language, okay? That was, and so I was in maximum security prison for a year. And during that year of maximum security, that's when I decided to stop, to be writing in my novels and fiction and drama and poet in the Koyo language, my mother tongue. And I wrote my first novel in Koyo called um, Devil on the Cross, in Koyo on toilet paper in prison. So, I use literature as a way of connecting to the out, to the to the world outside the yeah. 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 So in the same way, when I was now in exile, I used my la my writing as a way of connecting to Kenya. Yes. So my mother tongue, the was very very important for my survival in prison. And it was very, very important for my survival in exile. Every person, whether in Africa or Europe, has a right to their mother tongue or to the language of their culture. And it does not matter if that language is spoken by only five people. Those five people have a right to their language and to the intellectual production of ideas in their language. But those languages can then relate to other languages through translations or through adding other languages to what one already has. The problem with Africa and the, colon the formerly colonized as a whole is that the whole intellectual community operates within European languages. In other, in other, the entire intellectual production of ideas is in foreign languages or is in European languages, okay? And the majority of African people, uh, working people, the farmers, the, the majority speak African languages. So African languages, they are there. African languages are spoken by the majority of the people, but the intellectual production, you know, yeah. or rather the languages of power are, happen to be European languages, yeah. The upright revolution, I wrote in Nigekoi first. It's called, you know, to a career moro garu. Okay. That story has now been translated into 83 languages uh, in the world. Uh, and most of them actually African. So here's a story which written in one African in one African language but now it's available in several African languages, but also available in several European and Asian languages. But there are things which are beginning to happen in post-independent era that we could not really quite understand. Uh, uh, and it's Fanon who gave us a vocabulary by which to understand what was happening in the post-colonial era, you know. Uh, before Fanon, we saw things in kind of black and white. Fanon made us understand, you know, about the connection between economic uh, independence, uh, political independence, and cultural independence, that you could actually become politically independent, but not necessarily economically independent. And even if you become independent, 
there could also be economic uh, class differences within the newly independent uh, country. The decolonization of the mind is very, very important for any, uh, for uh, Africa and the formerly colonized world. Very, very important. Or for anybody for that matter, because even Europe needs to decolonize itself. You know, because the Europe, the West we have, is a Europe which grew out of, uh, you know, slave trade, you know, grew out of colon colonizing other people and so on, you know. So Europe also, and the West, also needs to decolonize. Many European cities, you know, uh, London, say, Paris, you know, uh, Madrid, you know, uh, Lisbon, you know, were built on uh, profits made out of the African body, out of the enslaved African, the, the labor of the African people, is what actually built many of the modern European cities. So modernity in Europe is rooted in African enslavement. That Euro uh, uh, Europe, people of Europe have moved, have occupied more of other people's lands than any other continent, right? You know, European peoples have been are in New Zealand, European peoples are in Australia, in America, uh, in Latin America, everywhere. So the European people are the ones who have moved more into other continents historically than people from any other continent, okay? So if you compare that with the, the few immigrants from Africa and Asia and so on, in fact, they are minuscule <laughs> by comparison, right? Many government, authoritarian government suppress writers because they want to suppress the capacity of people to imagine different futures, you know. Because imagination, the capacity to picture a different world, the capacity to picture different possibilities is very, very important for the human, right? You know, uh, and literature is very, very important in that respect, you know. Uh, but authoritarian regimes want to limit the capacity of people to imagine different futures. So in that sense, literature becomes very, very important. And not only literature, all works of art becomes very important because this capacity to fire, you know, the imagination, yeah. And to say the present, we cannot just accept the present conditions. So you need other energies that come and imagine a different world. Yeah. I think Africa has a chance to imagine that different world. Africa, Asia, and Latin America. If you really want to understand the present world, you know, the literature you want to read is literature from the Africa and from Asia and from Latin America. That's really what is able to capture really uh, the reality of the world, you know, and is the one which also begins to imagine different possibilities here. Yeah.